here in Western Colorado, we really bend nature to do what we hope that it'll do for us. And so even though we don't get rain, we'll, we'll move water out of the rivers. Um, we, we see that time and time again. We try modifying our environment to, to suit our needs. To, to We try to have the, this attempt of having Mother Nature submit to what we want it to be if it's not exactly <laughs> what it was. And sometimes that can be very successful, and sometimes it's it's a disaster, right? Uh, kind of the mantra is that Mother Nature always bats last. So with all of our efforts that we do, Mother Nature will have the final say. But that definitely is a hallmark of the West, and, and that Taft quote, I think, really matches that. And I just love that Taft quote about how we truly are a paradise once we add water, and we can truly make our community a paradise. Welcome to the Cooler Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kuehlhorn, and I'm excited to have you join me as I interview community members and business leaders from the communities in which I live, work, and serve through my business cooler garage doors. We're going to bring you highlights on characters in our communities. Why? Because community matters, and I want to know more about who is behind our business and leadership in order to understand and support the community fabric that our relationships make up. And collectively, we can build stronger communities that support our lifestyles, our youth, and our health. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cooler Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kuehlhorn. And today I have Zebulon Miracle, the Executive Director of the United Way of Mesa County joining us. Zebulon, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's a it's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, I've done a little bit of um, research on you, and you sound like a historian. You've grown up on the Western Slope. Um, I'm really interested in getting to know your story and what drives you, and where exactly did you grow up? So I was born and raised here in Grand Junction. Um, again, uh, uh, born just up the road in St. Mary's Hospital, uh, went to high school here, but then went away for college. I, I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder for, okay. for my undergrad degrees. Um, really enjoyed it over there. Really enjoyed uh, being on the front range and um, thought that that's might be where I where I'd stay. But then I had a tremendous opportunity right out of college, uh, a museum that I'd been doing some volunteer work for and an internship for offered me a position. They basically called saying, we're putting together next year's budget. Would you like to be in it or not? And uh, coming right out of school, that was just such a great opportunity. So I spent um, awesome. almost a dozen years at, at the museums of Western Colorado, kind of worked my way up um, through the ranks there, if you will, and, and became a curator there and, and oversaw our collections and some of our policies. And um, mm. Since then, I've just been able to really establish some roots uh, here in Grand Junction. I have a family here. My family still lives here. My wife's family still lives here. So it's it's very much home. It's very much part of yeah. the, the DNA. That's awesome. What did you study in Boulder? I studied history and anthropology. Okay. okay. So that's, that's pretty aligned with um, curator work and yeah. um, what... So tell me a little bit more about the museum. You said that um, history of the West. Yeah. And so um, the, the museums of Western Colorado here in museums Grand Junction is yeah. a uh, three-part museum. So there's a history and anthropology museum in downtown Grand Junction. There's also a historic apple orchard, uh, cross orchards, historic site um, out on the Eastern side of the Valley. And then on the western side of the valley in Fruta, Colorado, is the Dinosaur Journey Museum. So I was okay. based at the History Museum. And again, um, really enjoyed just being able to dive into to what makes Grand Junction, what makes Western Colorado, what makes Colorado, what makes the West the West, right? What, what are the, the people, the characters, the conditions, the landscapes, the stories that contribute to its identity today? Yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed my time there. I was there for, uh, again, almost a dozen years and, and just had a tremendous opportunity to to meet some great, interesting people, to really dive into to stories, to really research. And um, then uh, what, what my true passion was, was to share all those findings and sort of yeah. be able to either put together an exhibit or write a write an article or write a paper or um, present a lecture talking about it. Having people have that aha moment or that spark was really inspiring. 
Shame. After that, I went down to Gateway, Colorado. Um, I'm not sure if you've been, but it's a it's a very Brown. beautiful uh, one. It's a beautiful drive, to, no matter which direction you come from. Yes. And two, it's just a beautiful uh, facility. Uh, it was started by the the founder of the Discovery Channel. And I went down there and uh, I oversaw the auto museum and also started offering educational programming there. And so I was hey. able to take people from all over the world to this little tiny corner in Western hey. Colorado and really show them what makes this so world class. And now hey. I've been here at a United Way Mesa County for about two and a half years now. So another way to get back to the community, but still uh, I'm able to keep my heart in history, but also able to, to build up some of the building blocks of what makes our community. Yeah, I love that. I love, okay, so I love actually knowing that the different museums are actually tied in together. That's, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. And I could imagine that the collective share of resources just gives it that much oomph. Um, and then in my, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny bit of research yeah. history, like I can just imagine, you know, the Grand Junction playing such a pivotal role with the, the junction of Gunnison and, and Colorado Rivers. Um, what, what are some things that stand out as far as like that story, the, the history and, and what makes the West, the West and, and Grand Junction specifically? Well, I'm, I'm glad forward. that you brought up the, the two rivers coming together here, right? That's where Grand Junction gets its name. The, the yeah. Colorado river used to be known as the Grand River. And so we were the <laughs> junction of the gotcha. Grand and the Gunnison. So here we are at the Grand Junction. Sure. And if it were not for those two rivers, um, virtually every blade of grass, every tree that you see out here that's not a cottonwood tree, every building, every orchard, every vineyard that we're known for today really shouldn't exist here or yeah. couldn't exist, I should say, without those two rivers coming together. Uh, President Taft came out here. At, uh, he spoke in September of 1909. He was out in western Colorado, our first president to visit the area. And he was out yeah. in western Colorado to open the Gunnison Tunnel, a big irrigation project outside of Montrose. And he has a favorite uh -huh. quote of mine. He said that you look at the country in some places and it would seem it was the most godforsaken spot there was on earth. Then you progress a mile or two and you see the influence of water. And it seems hey. a paradise. It's as magic hey. as rubbing Aladdin's lamp. And for me, that really captures hey. what Grand Junction, what Western Colorado, and what a lot of the West is. Here in the West, water is just so vital. And if it were not for those two rivers coming through, we would not have the community that we have today. Here in the West, here in Western Colorado, we really bend nature to do what we hope that it'll do for us. And so even though we don't get rain, we'll, we'll move water out of the rivers. Um, we, we see that time and time again. We try modifying our environment to, to suit our needs. To, to and We try to have the, this attempt of having Mother Nature submit to what we want it to be if it's not exactly what it was. And sometimes that can be very successful and sometimes it's it's a disaster, right? Uh, kind of the mantra is that Mother Nature always bats last. So with all of our efforts that we do, Mother Nature will have the final say. But that definitely is a hallmark of the West. And, and that Taft quote, I think, really matches that. And I just love that Taft quote about how we truly are a paradise once we add water and we can truly make our community a paradise. Yeah. Water is critical. <laughs> Oh, and, and, and you're like this year, I think we're all really seeing that. Um, and, and that's a story that as we trace through, through archeology, span as we study the, the peoples that have made up the West, we can see when, when droughts really wreak havoc on an area and can, can bring a civilization down quite quickly, or at least, um, hamper a civilization or a culture or, or a community quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly all along the West, we're dealing with some significant multiple years of drought. And um, my understanding, and I can't remember where I've heard this from, but is our water for Grand Junction, is that coming from the Grand Mesa as far as like town, municipality water, drinking water? Yeah. So um, there is uh, several different fresh water suppliers in Grand Junction. So for like drinking water for, for domestic use. And I believe the city of Grand Junction and the um, Ute Water, one of our bigger water um, uh, utilities out here, get their water from Grand Mesa. 
I believe Clifton pulls theirs from the Colorado River, but on occasion, the others also have to pull from the Colorado River if runoff off the Grand Mesa is, is light. Yeah. yeah, awesome. All right, let's shift gears a little bit, Zebulon, and your work with the United Way. So you mentioned you've been there for a couple of years, two and a half years. Yeah. Um, I primarily know of United Way through commercials, right? It's okay. a larger um, national and likely international. Yes. And and how does this play on the local level in, in Grand Junction? Yeah, you know, when I when I applied for this job, um, you know, I, I, I had some background working with nonprofits and, and some background working with some nonprofits in the health and human service industry. Okay. But but like you, uh, United Way was one of those things that, that I had always heard of. Um, I donated to United Way in the past. Yeah. I, I had helped our workplace have a workplace campaign, but... I, I guess I didn't realize just how complex and how large United Way was until I, I applied for this job. And so I'm, I'm always always excited to share some of those findings. As you mentioned, United Way is an international organization. Now there's there's chapters all over the world. Um, mm-hmm. By many measures, it's the world's largest nonprofit, um, you know, depending mm-hmm. on what matrix you want to use to line that up. But all that being said, it's still very localized. And one of the things that I was staggered to learn is that there are over 1,100 United Way chapters within the United States, 1,100 just within the U.S. And the reason for that is that each chapter is is extremely independent. We, we all create our own budgets. We all make our own hiring decisions. We all determine where the, the monies and resources that we raise go. It's not United Way worldwide. It's, it's us. <laughs> so the reason why there's 1,100 chapters is... The needs of Mesa County are different than the needs of Miami, which are different than the needs in Pittsburgh, which are different than the needs in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Yeah, Each community is a little bit different, and yeah. nobody knows our communities like like us. And so what I, what I truly love about the United Way model, what gets me so excited, is that it is the local community, it's us right here, that determines what our community needs are right now. What are the biggest needs facing Mesa County? And then it's this community that rallies together to find the resources, whether that be financial, volunteer, advocacy work, to help fight those problems. And then it's this community that determines how we take those funds that we raise, how we take those resources that we raise, and who are the best partners to give those to. So everything is community-driven, and and I'm very sincere in that. Money does not go um, back up to the mothership, and then they tell us, hey, you have to fund this person or that person. Instead... Every dollar we raise here stays here. Every funding decision as far as what programs are we going to help provide grant funding to is decided right here. And and that's because our community knows our issues. So I, I love just how localized it is. And that was one of the yeah. things that I was most surprised about when I was researching this show. I love that. What are some of the, I'm sure you've got multitudes, um, yeah. but some of the priority projects that are on the plate right now? Yeah, so we currently provide grant funding to 33 different nonprofits that are running wow. 43 different programs. All of our programs that we help fund are related to health, education, and self-reliance. Okay. In addition, we've launched a countywide Imagination Library project. So that is um, books, free books, uh, a new book each month in the mail for children under the age of five. No strings attached, uh, no cost at all to the parents, just a uh, Go on to our website, uh, register, and, and you can get a free book in the mail. That's part of the, the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Hey, hey. We're doing a lot of work right now with volunteerism. We're about to launch a big volunteer hub. We listen to the community. We listen to our stakeholders. We listen to our partners. And there are so many people that want to give back their time. There are so many people that want to volunteer. But if you want to volunteer, you're stuck going through Google, researching every nonprofit, hoping that you call the right telephone number. What we want to do is create a centralized hub to where we're matching people that have time to give with organizations that that have a need for volunteers. Mm-hmm. And then the other two projects that we're really focused on right now is the child care issue within our community. We're some 4,000 slots short of the number of, of child care um, enrollment spots that we have in our community, not to mention it's extremely expensive. And then the issue of homelessness in our community, we're trying to rally our stakeholders together to talk to the community about what are the causes of homelessness, what are possible solutions, 
how can you go from somebody going, wow, somebody should do something about this problem that we all see to having people go to, I know what to do about this. I know how I can be engaged. So those are yeah. our biggest programs right now. It's, it's um, a lot going on, but um, <laughs> it's also very, very exciting. It's a, it's a fun time to be here for sure. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And I, um, what I'm hearing is, is community coalition work. Mm -hmm. And would you say that the United Way of Mesa is more or less a hub resource for nonprofits and, you know, really, um, a leader in that community coalition, because some of the things that you're speaking about, whether it's homelessness, I mean, that's, that's huge in itself, childcare, yeah. all these aren't any one entity, like we don't have not one entity can solve it. Right. So it's a collaborative effort and that's the, that's the community coalition piece. Yeah. Exactly. You hit it right on the head there. Um, when we talk about trying to help with the homelessness issue in, in Mesa County, United Way isn't going to open up an emergency housing or an emergency food program ourselves. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to those programs that are in place, that infrastructure that's in place and say, how can we come back to the community with a unified message or a unified voice or a unified goal that highlights the outstanding boots on the ground work that those agencies are already doing? Same thing with volunteerism, right? We're not going to replace every nonprofit's volunteer coordinator. Instead, what we want to do is just make it easier for the community to get in touch with those volunteer coordinators. So you're right. Yeah. We, we are trying to position ourselves as a hub to where if you want to be part of the solution, if you want to get back, if you want to know more about the local nonprofits and the great work being done, we can offer that for you. So yes, we are trying to, to be that, that hub for, for health and human service work being done in Mesa County. Yeah. A bit of an amplifier too. Yeah, exactly. Give, because give each of those organizations, there's just so much great work going on. You can't expect them to do that work in addition to the great work that they're already doing. So, so yeah, right. that's, that's right. exactly what we're aiming for right now. Yeah. I love it. What, um, you know, so from your perspective, you grew up in this area, historian, um, community coalition leader, facilitator. I, know that there's a significant shift happening on the Western slope. Um, there's an influx of folks leaving the front range, other cities coming into these smaller towns and changes, changes happening. Thank you. Um, what have you noted change wise? And then the follow-up question is like for the future, you know, looking at the crystal ball, what are we excited about? Well, um, to, to your point, there's no doubt changes happening in our communities, right? And, and um, also, as a historian, though, that's, that's not a new story, right? right, um, the, right. This, this, these communities here in Western Colorado now, um, most of our communities, most of our towns now are approaching 130 years old, and, and every decade's brought change and has brought something yeah. new. So, um, well, we all look around and see massive changes, we see different people moving in. We see traditional industries maybe leaving, but new industries replacing that. There, there are times that you can look at that change and, and those issues taking place in our communities today and just substitute a couple of words and you'd be reading an article from 1950, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess in, in some ways, reflecting on the history of our communities shows that, that our communities change quite a bit. And our communities have adapted over 130 years. And, and sometimes we adapt well, and we've either embraced that change or we prepared for that change. And sometimes change coming to our community has has led to bust, right? It's it's that whole boom bust cycle of, of who we are. If it... So I guess that's my long way of saying absolutely change is happening, but change has happened for 130 years. It's, it's just part of part of our culture's identities too, is, is this influx of different industries, different, um, different ideas, different, um, commercial industries, uh, different demographics all coming and leaving in, in areas. Yeah. But can I jump in real yeah, quick, Zebulon on that? And I just wanted to recognize, you know, that, um, historic perspective is, is really refreshing. I feel like certainly myself and I can see it, you know, we'll get caught up and today's drama off yeah. <laughs> another historian i don't know if you follow ray dalio at all okay 
Um, I love his books and he's a historian on a, on a macro level and certainly focused economically, but it's interesting just to get this per step perspective because yes, change is actually the only constant. Right. And when we go through influx of change, it, it is pretty much a repetition of a cycle that has happened at some point in the past, even if it hasn't happened in like our lifetime or, you know, I, I talk with business owners right now and, um, somebody that's been in business for 50, 60 years has not seen the environment that's at play today. Right. But it's happened prior to a lifetime, right. but right. And that's so right. I just wanted to recognize that like, it's really refreshing. And I think in that bigger picture, looking at this, it's like, okay, what's happening is actually somewhat normal. And now we yeah. just get to navigate it on this different plane. Right. And, and so I think our responsibility is to, to navigate that responsibly, right? It, it's sure. one thing to say, oh, yeah, change happens, right? Um, yeah. it, it, it's just part of a, a natural, natural progression of, of, of a community. But what we need to do is we need to reflect back on those lessons that history taught us as change faces our communities, right? We, and, we've learned some lessons in the past. We've seen some okay. things that have worked. We've seen some things that haven't worked. And so using that lens of history to, to one, recognize change is, is a constant, but also two, go, hey, well, once upon a time, our community faced a similar issue. This worked, but this did not work is, is very beneficial for sure. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. All right. Now for the historian, what's, uh, what's exciting in the future? What do you see at play either for United Way, the community at large, wherever you want to kind of aim, point and shoot, but what, um, what excites you? What's coming oh, up? Oh, goodness. Um, but I, I, I'm trying to think which, which route I want to take to answer that question. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with United Way. Um, I'm excited about the, this organization. I, I do believe this organization is doing a great job turning to our stakeholders, turning to the people doing tremendous work in our community, turning to, to our donors who are extremely generous in our community, and turning to people that are looking for services and, and are for looking for some support and taking those different stakeholder views and saying, okay, well, how can we fit in part of that picture? So I'm, I'm excited about the increased collaborative work that mm -hmm. we're doing. I'm excited about the impact work that this organization is, is going to have on our community. I, I am excited about being able to, to offer some help in, in a number of different areas. Every year, the, the grant funding that we give out helps impact 50,000 of our friends and neighbors. That's one in three people in our community. Love that. And I'm excited that we can offer that and, and grow that, adapt as our community, as we said, changes. We also need to adapt and change what it is that we're helping support. So as our community needs change, I'm excited that this organization is positioning itself to, to help with those changes as, as they come up. I think we've got a, a good model going right now for that. As far as me, one of the things that, um, that I'm most excited about is how much improvement, how much uh, advances, I should say, have come when when we combine science and history and, and anthropology together. Mm -hmm. So our understanding of the West, our understanding of the earliest peoples here, it is getting far more sophisticated. It's, it's getting far more in-depth. We're understanding far more because science is really helping out with that. So how we're able to date some of the oldest sites in North America, mm -hmm. which are found here in Western Colorado, that science is just moving at such an interesting rate that it's showing us a better, better picture of the past. Um, right now, the, the big push to digitalize information, uh, you can go online and you can find the U.S. census from, from past decades quite easily. You can find volumes of, of articles that have been written. You can find original manuscripts that no single person would ever have the ability to read all on their own. So this idea of crowdsourcing our understanding okay. of history is really cool that, that we can empower people to be at home and, and find some information that historians are looking for or making history more accessible for, for families to go through. Right Before, if you wanted to study genealogy, it was a, a trip to 
museum or to your library and going through microfilm and needing to know how to use that versus today you can find out so much about your family's story with with resources that are online and that just creates that spark and that wonder that it is really going to help in the future so again this this cool idea of how much technology is helping us understand the past and then also this idea that history or I should say at least information is is very, very accessible now and how people can start using that. So that, that makes me really excited. Yeah, I love that. I can feel your passion. <laughs> um, all right. So the opportunity for whether it's private business or community members to get involved with United Way and you know, other community projects. How do how do folks reach out? How do folks get engaged? Yeah. With you in, so in the efforts? Uh, you know, the, the obvious answer is is go to our website, unitedwaymesacounty.org. You can learn all about our organization. You can learn about what we do. You can learn about ways to to give. You can learn about sponsorship opportunities. Um awesome. yeah, that's that's the the best way to find out about our organization. And, and of course, I highly encourage you to do that. We, we need all the, the support and help we can get to make this difference. But the more, I, I think, interesting answer for, for your, your viewers and listeners that, that I want to impart is become engaged, become informed. Um, an issue unidentified is an issue unsolved. So, yes, okay. we need financial support. We need volunteer support. But really, if, if, if you're tapped out on that for the year, if, if you don't have the bandwidth for that right now, then I would encourage you just just become informed. Find out the issues facing your community. Find out the issues facing your local nonprofits. Find out what it is that your community is, is struggling with the most. And then really drill down on that. Because again, if you don't understand what the problems in your community are, it's really hard for for that solution to come, right? We have to understand yes. what problems are facing our community before we can solve them. So having an informed community, a community that really understands what the issues are, that are understanding the work that's happening to solve those issues, and that are understanding how they can be involved early on, just, just financial or, or time support, mm -hmm. really does wonders. So get engaged, okay. know the issues, get passionate about an issue, find one that you really care about, and um, you'll you'll make a, a huge difference in your community. Yeah, I love that. Well, we'll push on that. And um, you know, a couple of things as we as we wrap up this conversation. So, on on what you just you know piggybacking on you know understanding the problem. Sometimes the the symptom that we see is not the real problem, right? <laughs> and um, that's one of the things I recognized in in my experience with community coalitions and and working in. Uh, you know, identifying some of the the surface level problems, but then really underneath, and it takes a little bit of time. But also, one thing through our conversation that I'm starting to sense, you know, might be part of your essence is all around connection. And at the end of the day, this community work is connecting people to people, people with resources, and um, really looking at what drives. I mean, a lot of times that human experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. And then right. that aligns with your extraction of history and, and pulling these pieces together. It's it's really beautiful, man. <laughs> well, thank you. And and I, I, I kind of can't really follow that up with anything. I think you hit it uh, even better than I can. Um, you, you're absolutely right. It is about it is about being part of a community and part of a community is you're going to have diverse opinions. You're going to have diverse views for, for, sure. for how to solve the problem, but yeah, then you're sure. even going to have debate and question as far as what the problem is in the first place. And so getting to those root causes, listening to different viewpoints, understanding different solutions, understanding what's worked is, is just going to help us get to that solution. And at the end, we all want a strong, healthy community where everyone can thrive. So, Getting the building blocks for how we get there, getting pieces for how we get there starts with understanding. Yes, yes. Beautiful vision. Zebulon, I appreciate your passion. I appreciate the mission that you're on. Um, we'll be sure to include in our show notes how people can reach out and get engaged with the United Way and other community level efforts. And um, yeah, thank you for your time. I really appreciate this conversation. Oh, I, I appreciate you having me. 
And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, a, a beautiful December day, and, and happy holidays. And I hope uh, 2023 is a, is a banner year for you. Yeah, here, here. Same to you, my friend. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.